Hello and welcome back to The Pisky Trap, a series where we explore the folklore, history and legends from across Devon and Cornwall. First off, a huge thank you again to all of you who've been listening to the series so far and for all your lovely feedback on our last episode, which seems like a lifetime ago now, where we explored Cornish knockers. Also, a massive thank you to those of you who've already subscribed to my Patreon. I really appreciate that because it enables me to keep researching and to keep bringing you these episodes. I'll leave a link in the show notes, but you can find my page at patreon.com forward slash the Pisky Trap. And if you're enjoying the series so far, please give us a like or feel free to leave your comments and your ideas. You can find the Pisky Trap on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just before we get started, if you're a fan of Cornish history and folklore, then I highly recommend you check out The Cornish Bird, a fantastic podcast and blog by the brilliant Elizabeth Dale. I really enjoy reading the blog and listening to the episodes because they delve into that long-forgotten or hidden aspects of Cornwall's past, a mixture of folklore and history And if you've been listening to this series, then you'll know how much I enjoy the blend of those two things. From stories about local ghosts and smugglers, to quirky Cornish characters or ancient sites dotted around the county, there's so much fascinating stuff. So I definitely recommend checking out the cornishbirdblog.com or you can find the Cornish Bird podcast on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, and loads of other platforms. Anyway, back to the episode. It seemed like it was about time we took a little look and exploration into some of the tales and legends surrounding the Cornish Pisky. In the introduction to this series, I spoke about the title of The Pisky Trap, and the idea that it was a phrase that me and my mates would use when we were growing up. And I think That's a good example of how traditional pisky folklore kind of finds its way into our modern world. You know, um, something goes wrong. It must have been the piskies. I was late. Um, I got lost. Must have been the piskies. Now, although it's often said in that light-hearted way, I like to think of it as a bit of a nod to an earlier Cornish mindset and a way of thinking. And to me that's certainly something worth exploring further. In other parts of the UK, or elsewhere in the world, you may well have come across the term pixie, used to describe a certain kind of legendary creature associated with fairy folklore. In Cornwall, we tend to call these creatures piskies. If you were to Google the term Cornish pisky, you'd probably find yourself faced with a range of different images, many of them a fairly typical and recurring stock image of a little gnome-like character, perhaps sat on a toadstool, quite a lot of brass and pewter figurines depicting a little crouched figure, usually with little pointed boots, unruly hair that sometimes comes up into a point, and then the typical long ears, something that we've actually incorporated into the cover artwork for this series. On the other hand, there are also depictions of little people in very smart clothes, often with pointed red or green hats or caps. There are so many different stories from all across the county involving piskies that it's a tricky task trying to decide which tales to focus on. Because it's such a broad topic and there are so many stories, I've opted in this episode to focus attention, for the most part, on the eastern parts of Cornwall. I've also chosen to explore the various themes that seem to keep cropping up in these stories, and so we'll be looking at examples of tales that seem to fall within those particular themes or categories as we go. Helping me along the way will be Anna Chalton, author of the brilliant Cornish Folk Tales of Place, which includes many stories of piskies from all across North and East Cornwall. Anna and I had a chat a while back, and you're going to be hearing extracts of that conversation as we go along. 
As we again enter the realms of magic and fairy lore here, this is going to be an exploration not just of local stories, but also local beliefs and traditions, trying to understand the significance of these tales and why we should keep telling them. So, without further ado, here's our next episode, Cornish Piskies. Fairies of Cornwall may be divided into four classes. The small people, the pixies, pronounced piskies or pisgies, the spriggans, and the knockers. That was a quote from the opening of a chapter in Margaret Ann Courtney's Cornish Feasts and Folklore, published in 1890. There seems to have been a real interest during the 19th and early part of the 20th century in gathering together many of the traditional stories and folk tales, and some of the writers I've mentioned in this series before. But in this episode, we're also going to be drawing upon a few different sources that we haven't explored before. Ennis Tregarthen wrote her North Cornwall Fairies and Legends, published in 1906. And then we have the work of the Quilla Cooch family from Polperro. Most notably, Thomas and Jonathan Quillacooch, who basically collected a lot of the local stories and local histories from all across southeast Cornwall back in the 19th century. Another really interesting source actually comes from an American anthropologist called, and apologies if I get this wrong, Walter Evans Venz, and his book The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries was published in 1911. It has a whole section on Cornwall, and what's really fascinating is it includes a range of different interviews with people from around that time from all across Cornwall. Across the work of all these writers are countless tales surrounding the Pisky. And we get a sense that some of the stories and traditions focused around this creature seem to go back quite a long way into the distant past. Ennis Tregarthen talks about the Cornish belief in the little people being a very ancient one and perhaps even having its roots in Cornwall's pre-Christian past. Before we go any further, I feel we should discuss this term, pisky. Alongside the obvious variations in the name and the pronunciation and the spelling, are there any fundamental differences between the pixie, described in other parts of Britain and elsewhere, and the Cornish pisky? Well, Robert Hunt, who I've mentioned in the past, talks about it in the third edition of his Popular Romances of the West of England. Though what's interesting to note is that even he, and other writers are guilty of this too, sometimes plays around with or mixes up the different names and pronunciations. He says, and I quote, The Pisky, or Pixie, of East Devon and Somersetshire is a different creature from his cousin of a similar name in Cornwall. The former is a mischievous but in all respects a very harmless creation, who appears to live a rollicking life amidst the luxuriant scenes of those beautiful counties. The latter, the Piskies of Cornwall, appear to have their wits sharpened by their necessities. End quote. So, Hunt there seems to be comparing Piskies in Cornwall to Pixies in Devon and Somerset. And there's the implication that in Cornwall these creatures are perhaps less cheerful and benign and maybe a bit more cunning. In the same chapter, he basically goes on to compare the Pisky with Victorian London street urchins. And there's this sort of implication that their cunning and their deviousness comes out of necessity, that their character is shaped by their circumstances. Now... What does he mean by that? I think he's talking about 
the changes and the differences in the landscape as you get further west. Because he goes on to say, and here he's still talking about the amiable pixies in Devon, no such fairies are ever met with on Dartmoor. A few, judging from Mrs Bray's tales, may have been tempted into the lovely valley of the Tavy, but certainly they never cross the Tamar. The darker shades in the character of the Cornish fairy almost dispose me to conclude that they belong to an older family than those of Devonshire. End quote. We have that mention of Dartmoor almost as a sort of border where the folklore starts to change a bit. And I should mention that the Mrs Bray that Hunt's referring to was another 19th century folklorist who collected stories from parts of Devon. Hunt's also presenting this theory that the Cornish Pisky might be an older tradition. And Evans Vence, in his book published a few years later, reaches the same conclusion, that the Pisky might be older, and that even the original word might come from Cornish, though it's hard to say for certain. We get the sense that the character of this creature echoes that change in the landscape as you cross the Tamar. Hunt then goes on to say, This fairy is a most mischievous and very unsociable sprite. His favourite fun is to entice people into the bogs by appearing like the light from a cottage window, or as a man carrying a lantern. Thomas Quiller Cooch, in his Notes and Queries of 1855, wrote of Piskies, They have the power of making themselves seen, heard and felt. They interest themselves in man's affairs, now doing him a good turn, anon taking offence at a trifle, and leading him into all manner of mischief. The rude gratitude of the husbandman is construed into an insult, and the capricious sprites mislead him on the first opportunity, and laugh heartily at his misadventures." End quote. Time and again we hear mention of being led astray, and it brings us into one of the major themes in the stories of Piskies, and that is this idea of being what's called Pisky-led, or mazed as it's sometimes known. This idea that you can quite suddenly, and often inexplicably, become lost, disorientated, unable to find your way home, and it's because the Piskies are toying with you and have led you astray. Margaret Ann Courtney says, When mischievously inclined, Pisky often leads benighted people a sad dance, like Will-o'-the-Wisp. He takes them over hedges and ditches, and sometimes round and round the same field, from which they in vain try to find their way home, although they can always see the path close at hand until they sit down and turn their stockings the wrong side out. As an old lady, born in the last century, whom I well knew, once told me she had done. End quote. I love this idea that you can almost reverse the pisky charm or spell that you're under by quite literally turning your socks inside out. And I'm really fascinated by this idea of being mazed or pisky-led. A good example comes from William Bottrell, and it's a story called The Pisky-Led Commercial Travellers Ride Over the Hills. The story follows a travelling pin maker who's down from Birmingham and decides to make a day trip to explore St Ives. On his return journey, he decides he's going to take the old road back to Penzance and see the mine workings of Wheel Wreath along the way. He stops at an inn en route and follows the directions exactly as they are given to him. Despite this, before long he finds himself, at ten o'clock at night, somewhere near Lalant Downs, still having yet to find the mine, and now surrounded by a heavy fog. Finally, he sees a light glowing from somewhere in the darkness, and the traveller follows it until he reaches a cottage, and taps on the window. It turns out, the cottage is occupied by a couple named Jan and Molly, and after a bit of back and forth as the traveller explains his situation, he's welcomed inside. The next bit of the story comes directly from Bottrell. The worthy couple were quite sure that the pinmaker was pisky-led, because when they went over stairs a few minutes before his arrival, 
there was no appearance of the fog, which they both assured him was raised by the mischievous laughing goblin, as well as the many other strange appearances that beguiled him, such as making narrow lanes and bypaths look like broad turnpike roads. What seemed to him to be candles or blazing firelight seen through cottage windows, when approached, were found to be nothing but glowworms shining in the hedges, and to prevent the Pisky having any more power over him, they persuaded him to turn his coat inside out. So, after spending a few hours enjoying Jan and Molly's hospitality, Jan shows the traveller the way back to the turnpike road, where the mist has now disappeared. And just as day breaks, he sees St Michael's Mount in the distance, and finally makes his way back to Penzance. We have there this idea of a traveller becoming lost, and seemingly at the mercy of a pisky who has led them astray. So I want to delve a little deeper now into this idea of becoming mazed, and the thinking behind that concept. A while back I had a chat with Anna Chalton, a Cornish writer and poet, author of the brilliant Cornish Folk Tales of Place, and also writer for Mazed Tales, a project dedicated to collecting together the folklore of East Cornwall and telling it in interesting ways. And we got talking about this idea of becoming pisky-led. Well, I think it's to do a lot with, um, with, with the Cornish weather. So you can be up on the moors and the weather changes very suddenly. So you can suddenly be in a dangerous situation where the fog has come down and you are near the bogs and you can't find your way home. So I think that the, the whole um, idea of being pisky led on the moors is something that's origin is in, in the land and, and how it is if you go um, up on the moors. And sometimes the weather can change very quickly and it can be quite suddenly and then suddenly it's a hail, hailstorms or the mists come down. And so there, there must be some explanation for this and, and maybe the piskies have caused this so that maybe the piskies have have made it so that you suddenly can't find your way. So a seemingly straightforward and fairly logical reason behind the idea of becoming pisky-led, and it all being tied to the unpredictable nature of the Cornish weather and the nature of the landscape itself. We also have to take into account that the central character in Bottrell's story is a visitor who's not familiar with the area and therefore perhaps more likely to lose their way. But then we have stories which involve local people, farmers for example, who know the landscape really well, but even they can fall victim to the Piskies. In the short story called Pisky Led, retold in Anna's book, two farmers called John and William are out on the moors counting their cattle as they're grazing. It's been particularly bad weather, and as a result the fields and trackways have become flooded and boggy, so they're careful picking their way along. John spies their cattle out in one of the fields, but he also sees a herd of moorland ponies galloping past and throws a stick to urge them away from the water. What John doesn't realise is that the horses have been stolen by piskies and there are little stirrups plaited into their manes. When the horses are chased away, the nearby piskies become angry. John begins to walk back home through the bog, with William following behind. Suddenly, John finds himself sinking waist-deep into the mud. He tries to move, but he's stuck fast, and begins to fear he might sink to his death. The quick-thinking William takes up his walking stick and reaches across to help John, who grasps for it, all the while feeling as though little voices from the hedgerows are hooting and laughing at him and his misfortune. After much strain, John takes hold of the stick, and with a heave, William manages to haul John free from the mire. John thinks he's been pisky-led, but William claims he's just a bit mazed. After all, it was only a bit of mud. But both agree that since the horses have been stolen, they're going to have to keep a closer eye on their cattle from now on. Luckily, William happened to be wearing his socks inside out that day. Hence, he hadn't fallen victim to the piskies. 
As they walk home, they can feel little eyes watching them from the hedgerows. The lesson here is if you're ever out walking on the moors and you feel like you might be getting lost, be sure to turn your pockets inside out, just in case. There's a few different ideas contained within this short story. We have a slight distinction being drawn between the idea of becoming fully pisky led and simply becoming a bit mazed. Then we have the idea that animals can fall victim to the piskies as well. And in the case of horses, this is often referred to as pisky ridden. Alex Langstone, in his amazing book From Granite to Sea, mentions an article from the publication Cornish Mining Reporter, Agricultural and Family Journal, dated 1846, which reported a tale of piskies riding a pony in Los Withiel. It reads, The pony's owner found it one morning, lying in the corner of its field, in a terrible state. He sent for the local farrier, but by the time he had arrived, the pony had recovered. The following morning, the pony was in a poorly state again, and the farrier was quick to arrive, and quickly diagnosed that the pony had been pisky ridden during the previous night. The farmer and the farrier decided to stay up and keep watch the following night, and they climbed into an old tree overlooking the pony's field. Shortly after midnight, five small men appeared as if from nowhere, and quickly began a wrestling contest. After several lengthy bouts, the winner leapt on the back of the pony and dug his heels into its flanks. The horse took off at a pace, and the pisky rider sang a series of obscene songs. The pony continued to career about until dawn, when it finally collapsed, and the five piskies disappeared back to their own realm. The farmer decided to stable the pony after what they had witnessed, and it suffered no more ill effects. A brilliant example there, perhaps tapping into a genuine belief around that time that animals as well as people could fall victim to the piskies. I also love the description of these little characters as well, engaging in a wrestling contest and then riding about singing obscene songs. They're basically being described as little men, and that fits with a few descriptions from around that time. Thomas Quiller Cooch, writing in 1855, gives a great little description of piskies. About the height of a span, which is roughly nine inches, clad in green and having straw hats or little red caps on their heads. Whereas William Bottrell, writing in his third edition of Traditions and Hearthside Stories, says, According to the fairy belief of the old Cornish folk, the pisky has seldom been seen in any other shape than that of a weird, wizened-looking little old man. As such, he has often been spied on moonlit winter's nights, threshing the corn in the barns of lonely places. And there's something in Bottrell's description that reminds me of those creatures, the knockers, working away in the mines. We've talked about the idea of becoming pisky led and of animals being pisky-ridden, there's also the concept of being pisky laden and typically that seems to have meant that the pisky was hiding about your person in some way. A great little story from Minster Wood over near Boscastle is called The Pisky Who Rode in a Pocket. One day a pisky decides he wants a different adventure to stealing horses or junket and biscuits and waits on a rock in Minster Wood. He sees people passing by on the way to do their shopping, and eventually spies an elderly woman pass by and jumps inside the pocket of her dress. The old woman has been certain of the way she's going, right up until the moment the pisky lands in her pocket, whereupon she instantly becomes confused and disorientated. Anxious to be home before nightfall, she hurries on, but finds herself taking the wrong path. Meanwhile, the pisky chuckles to himself. He's having the time of his life. As darkness falls, the poor woman becomes more and more lost and agitated, and eventually she sits herself down on an old tree trunk. By now, realising she must be mazed, she suddenly remembers to turn her pockets inside out, 
and as soon as she does, the little fellow drops onto the ground, causing the old woman to shriek. In frustration, she looks around her, trying to find the right path, and all the while the pisky laughs. But finally, as day breaks, the little pisky scampers off across the bridge between Minster and St. Juliet, and with a sunny day before her, the old woman is finally able to make her way home. A nice little self-contained story there that has a relatively happy ending. She does get to make it home in the end. But this also taps into that sense of mischief in the character of the Pisky, the slightly sadistic delight that they take in confusing people. We get a similar sense of that in the concept of Pisky rings and dances, which is another recurring theme. In the early 1900s, Evans Vence mentions an interview with 80-year-old Thomas Jago of Marazion, who said, and I quote, In certain grass fields, mushrooms growing in a circle might be seen of a morning, and the old folks, pointing to the mushrooms, would say to the children, Oh, the piskies have been dancing there last night. End quote. I think that reflects this commonly held belief that piskies would dance together in rings, sometimes engaging an unwary traveller in their revelry. There's one particular story that involves a boy trying to make his way home. Yes, yeah, so he's, he's walking home from the summer court fair and um, his mother has told him to put one of his items of clothing inside out so he doesn't get pisky lead on the way home across the fields at night but he he doesn't do this he doesn't believe her and uh, so of course he gets swept up into the pisky dance and he isn't really enjoying the dance the, the dance is very fast and the piskies are very very merry and very loud and he can't see a way out of the dance and he dances on and on through the fields and then finally he remembers his mother's advice and he turns one of his items of clothing, his jacket I think in, inside out and then suddenly he sees the last field home and he knows where he's going. Here we have another great example of that sense of mischief and the joy they take in tormenting people, sweeping them up into these rings or these dances. Something else that often crops up is the idea of pisky sight or being pisky eyed, meaning that a person has the ability to see the little people. We're reminded in many of the stories that piskies don't like to be seen unless they wish it, and they don't like their secrets being revealed either. I mentioned this idea in conversation with Anna when we were discussing the origin of this belief that piskies are invisible to most people. A lovely tale of of Eve's children, and um, Eve had many, many, many children, and she was in the middle of washing her children, who were all very dirty, and God came, and she just quickly showed him her washed children, her clean children, and he said, where are your other children? And she didn't want to show him the children who were dirty, and he said, well, all these dirty children shall from now on be invisible because if I can't see them, no one will see them. And so that's how the Piskies became invisible. And they, went, they were sent off to the moors and the secret places, the places where they wouldn't be seen. And um, also the Piskies are known as the little invisibles because no one can see them. So I think that's a, a lovely um, tale of, of how the Piskies became invisible. This idea of invisibility is something that's explored in a story from Ennis Tregarthen, which is called The Piskies Who Did Aunt Betsy's Work. It's also known simply as The Piskies and the Housework. It centres around a girl called Nanny, who's sent to stay with her great-aunt Betsy. Before she leaves, she's asked by her mother to help with all the housework, because if she proves herself, 
she might inherit some of her great aunt's hidden treasure. Each morning, the girl comes down to help, but all the work has already been done. Her aunt explains that the Piskies have taken a liking to her, and they do all the housework. Obviously, Nanny is fascinated and wants to see these little people, but her aunt explains that they're invisible, unless you have the Pisky sight. One way that you can get it is to find a four-leaf clover. So each day, Nanny goes out and picks wild flowers for her aunt, but fails to find a four-leaf clover, until one day her aunt's cat, Tinker, follows her and leads her to a four-leaf clover, which she passes three times over her eyes. The next morning, Nanny gets up extra early and walks into the kitchen to discover scores of little people washing and cleaning, singing and dancing, and having a merry old time. That is, until one of them sees Nanny watching from the doorway and raises the alarm. They realise that she must have the pisky sight, and they're angry at being spied on, so they all vow to leave Aunt Betsy's house for good and never return. From that day on, Aunt Betsy has to do her own housework, and Nanny is sent back to live with her parents. When Aunt Betsy passes away some years later, all of her treasure is gifted to strangers. In this story, we learn a little bit about this concept of pisky sight and the methods of obtaining it, but also the perils of having it, because the piskies don't like being observed unless they wish it. This idea of being pisky-eyed also feeds into another common theme in some of the tales, which involve appearances or visits by pisky children, who are then looked after by human families. There's a couple of examples that seem to come from around the Polpero area, and this is something I discussed with Anna. So there's Coleman Gray, which is the story of um, a pisky who comes to visit a farming family and um, he makes their house a lot happier and they really enjoy his company. And then he suddenly says, my dad has come. I'm away. My dad has come. And that story of the pisky child appearing um, comes again in Scary Wherry on the, on the moors where a, a baby um, turns up at an old lady's house and she nurtures him. And then his mum comes and he's away. So that story repeats. And then the midwife's tale, which is also set in Popero, um, is interesting because that tale um, is told all over. It's not just a Cornish tale, but that one, the midwife goes to deliver the pisky child and um, um, she gets some soap in her eyes and she's um, given the pisky sight and um, she sees many, many piskies and she keeps it to herself. But then one day the pisky father um, is stealing from the fair in Porpero and she sees him and she says, don't steal anything. And he gets very angry and he punches her in the eye um, that she had the pisky sight and she no longer has the pisky sight. And that's one of the themes of the, um, the piskies is that they are invisible to everybody apart from if they want to show themselves to you or if you have the pisky sight. A couple of nice examples there, some in which the pisky child returns to its parents after a short visit to the human world and that third story, The Midwife's Tale, taking a decidedly darker turn, where again we're warned not to interfere with them. We've looked so far at some of the main themes which seem to carry through many of these tales, but I'd like to explore some of the meanings and ideas that we can take from them, alongside some examples that incorporate these little people in slightly different ways even getting interwoven with religion as well.
There's a story called The Piskey's Revenge, which is again passed down to us by Ennis Tregarthen, in which an old man named Granfer Nan Kivel, who's a turf cutter, is clearing the ground around an old bog, which happens to be the home of the Piskies. Understandably, they're annoyed about this. But the old man isn't stupid, and always goes about his business upon the moors with one item of clothing turned inside out. So instead, the Piskies decide to exact their revenge in a different way. Discovering that the old man has a sweet tooth, they sneak into the kitchen and steal his bowl of junket, which is basically a sweetened milk dessert, and eat his sugar biscuits. It's definitely that you have to respect the Piskies and respect what they're doing. So, you know, not, not interfere at all with them. So if, if you um, leave them be when they're cleaning the house or threshing the corn or making their beds, then they'll be good to you. Sometimes they get involved with what you're doing um, in helping people. But if you um, interfere with what they're doing, then, then things don't go so smoothly. So they, they find out that Grandpa likes um, sugar. He's got a sweet tooth. And so they decide that they will revenge his cutting uh, of their their beds the, the ruining of their beds and they and for three nights they eat his biscuits that grandma has made for his birthday so they they're quite happy if you leave them be so where possible we're advised to leave them be and just let them go about their business Something that I find interesting and that's implied in this story is that there are certain places in the landscape which are their home, their territory, and again, that these are sites which should be left well alone. William Bottrell gives us a good example from West Cornwall. He says, and I quote, Not long ago, a woman of Mausel, a village near Penzance, told me that troops of small people not more than a foot and a half high, used on moonlit nights to come out of a hole in the cliff opening onto the beach, newly inside of the village and but a short distance from it. The little people were always dressed very smart and if anyone came near would scamper away into the hole. Mothers often told their children that if they went under the cliffs by night the small people would carry them away into Dicky Danji's hole. End quote. Dicky Danji's hole is an interesting term which I won't delve into too deeply here that links with stories from other parts of Cornwall and it almost warrants its own episode at some point but there are similar places where people are said to disappear if they're not careful or if they misbehave. There are also stories not only in Cornwall but in folklore from all over of people being carried off or whisked away by the little people. We have a story about a young man who takes a voyage with the Piskies, which comes from the Talon Bay area of southeast Cornwall. One day, a young lad is on his way back from Polpero, when he suddenly hears a voice cry out, I'm for Porthallow Green. The young man stops, and just as a bit of banter, replies, I'm for Porthallow Green, wishing he was already back there. But no sooner has he spoken the words, then he finds himself on the green, and surrounded by laughing piskies. A moment later, the cry goes up, I'm for Seaton Beach. And just as a bit of fun, the lad repeats, I'm for Seaton Beach. In an instant, he finds himself on Seaton Beach, where he throws down his bags and joins in with the piskies as they dance in a ring upon the sand. Then the cry goes up, I'm for the King of France's cellar and in the blink of an eye, he finds himself drinking a cup of the finest wine in the King of France's best cellar. He looks around in amazement. This is the first time he's ever ventured more than a few miles from his village, and now, here he is, in these magnificent surroundings, and with a fine feast laid out on the table. Thinking he'll never get an opportunity like this again, he decides to take a souvenir so he quickly grabs a golden goblet from the table 
before the cry comes up again. I'm for Seaton Beach. In a flash, they arrive back at the beach, where the boy grabs his bags before the cry goes up, I'm for Porthallow Green, and he finds himself back on the green. Later that night, he tells his family all about his adventure. With sceptical looks, they tell him he was probably just a bit mazed, but the young man, expecting this, pulls out the shiny golden goblet from his bag, and they're all amazed. We're told that the goblet stayed in the family for generations. Again, we have a story with a happy ending, and in this instance where the young man gets to keep the treasure he's found as well. We've looked at a broad range of different stories with various themes surrounding the Piskies, but I now really want to tap into the mindset of the people over the centuries who grew up with these creatures playing a part in their everyday lives, their beliefs and their superstitions. Who did Cornish people think they were? Where did these ideas and these beliefs come from? And what impact did it have on them? Ennis Tregarthen has the following to say, and I quote, The legends about the little people are very old. Some assert today that the tales about the Piskies are tales of a pygmy race who inhabited Cornwall in the Neolithic period, and that they are answerable for most of the legends of our Cornish fairies. If this be so, the oldest stories are legends of the little stone men. End quote. So here we're tapping into this idea that the Piskies are linked with the people who lived in Cornwall during the Neolithic period. And I can understand that thinking, especially when you think that Cornwall has so many ancient sites with carns and quoits and standing stones dotted all across the landscape. Sites which are still viewed as special places. It's not hard to see why people would believe that these places were populated by otherworldly beings or still had guardians from an ancient past. Henry Madden, who was an architect in Penzance in the early 1900s, wrote, and I quote, Pixies were often supposed to be the souls of the prehistoric dwellers of this country. As such, pixies were supposed to be getting smaller and smaller until finally they are to vanish entirely, end quote. Interesting that we have the term pixie being used in that instance. Evans Vence writes, There are possible connecting links in the not very common idea that the Piskies are the souls of unbaptized children, and in the more common notion that the Pobolveen, which means little people, are not the disembodied spirits, but the living souls and bodies of the old pagans, who, refusing Christianity, are miraculously preserved alive, but are condemned to decrease in size until they vanish altogether. So that there's another idea that um, the Piskies were Druids who didn't accept Christianity. And um, the more they resisted Christianity, the smaller they became. But uh, the ones who resisted the most became very, very small and became ants. But the ones who resisted just quite a lot became piskies. So there's quite a few um, tales like, or ideas like that. Interesting that religion becomes interwoven with some of these tales and beliefs as well. We come across this quite a lot, and it's the same with stories about giants as well where they're seen as representing the old ways, pre-Christian beliefs and practices. Herbert Thomas, who had at the time been editor of the Cornishman newspaper at the start of the 20th century, wrote, and I quote, I should say that the modern belief in pixies, or in fairies, arose from a very ancient Celtic or pre-Celtic belief in spirits. Just as among some savage tribes there is belief in gods and totems, here there was belief in little spirits, good and bad, who were able to help or to hinder man. Belief in the supernatural, in my opinion, is the root of it all. End quote. It's interesting that there's sometimes a bit of a crossover between spirits and fairy-like creatures, such as piskies. And we came across this in the previous episode where we were talking about the knockers and the link with the idea that these were the spirits of the long dead. 
Evans Vance interviewed 78-year-old John Wilmot of Constantine, who said, I always understood the Piskies to be little people. A great deal was said about ghosts in this place. Whether or not Piskies are the same as ghosts, I cannot tell, but I fancy the old folks thought they were. So there does seem to have been a bit of a crossover between the belief in spirits or ghosts and the little people or Piskies, and they seem to have been equally revered. There are stories of fishermen leaving a portion of their catch for bucca, which means spirit in Kanoic. In the same way, miners left a portion of pasty, but then there are some folklorists who draw a distinction between bucca being an actual deity and piskies being something slightly different. It does make you wonder whether people ever left offerings to the piskies as well. Another fascinating thing about Evans Vence's project back at the start of the 1900s is it gives us a little insight into traditions and customs that went way back into the 19th century, and probably beyond, that affected the way that people were living their everyday lives. For example, Henry Madden again, presumably harking back to his own childhood, said, and I quote, I have heard my nurse say that she could see scores of them whenever she picked a four-leaf clover and put it in the wisp of straw which she carried on her head as a cushion for the bucket of milk. Her theory was that the richness of the milk was what attracted them. Pixies, like fairies, very much enjoyed milk, and people of miserly nature used to put salt around a cow to keep the pixies away, and then the pixies would lead such mean people astray the very first opportunity that came. He then goes on to say, The country pixies inhabiting the highlands from above Newlyn onto St Just were considered a wicked sort. Their great ambition was to change their own offspring for human children, and the true child could only be got back by laying a four-leaf clover on the changeling. End quote. Again we have this idea of the nurse using the four-leaf clover, which enables her to see the piskies. And we have this idea we touched on earlier that the landscape, in this instance the wilder, sparsely populated lands in the far west of Cornwall, are home to these more malign creatures who can steal human children. When she was interviewed, Jane Tregertha of Newland said, and I quote, The old people thoroughly believed in the little folk, and that they gambled all over the hills on moonlit nights. Some pixies would rain down blessings and others curses, and to remove the curses, people would go to the wells blessed by the saints. Whenever anything went wrong in the kitchen at night, the pixies were blamed. After the 31st of October, or after Halloween, the blackberries are not fit to eat, for the pixies have been over them. End quote. I love little things like this, where we get insights into common practices and superstitions. When is not good to eat blackberries? And that tying into pisky mischief. The reference to the holy wells is an interesting one as well. There were holy wells up at Madron and San Creed, and there still are. And it makes you wonder, were people ever visiting as a cure or a form of protection against pisky magic? So here again we have religion being interwoven with pisky belief as well. It brings me back to the reason why so many of these stories and these folk tales are for me still fascinating. They're a link back to a way of seeing the world and a way of explaining the things around you that can be hard to connect with because it can seem so far removed from our everyday 21st century lives. That's why, for me, it's so important that these stories aren't lost, that we keep telling them. Because they're an important part of our past and of our heritage. So we created um, Maze Tales, mm. which um, is the traditional stories we brought together in a website of 100 or 90 tales. And um, we told them in, in different ways using animations and um, Cornishibai, which is Cornish street storytelling, illustrated storytelling. And we bought that we wanted to bring the tales to everyone so that everyone 
remembered the tales. And we do workshops um, and with children. And when we ask who are the Cornish fairies, there are always some children who know the Piskies. So, um, yeah, so, and often when we've been to um, somewhere before, then there's more children who remember the Piskies. So I, I think, but not all Cornish children that remember the Piskies. So it, it's quite, it is really important to keep bringing the traditional tales to, to as many people as possible. That's it for this episode of The Pisky Trap. I'd like to thank Anna Chalton for all her help with this episode, and I highly recommend checking out mazedtales.org if you get chance. I also highly recommend her book, Cornish Folk Tales of Place, which has many of the stories that we've looked at in this episode. You can also find out more information on all the different sources in the show notes. Again, a huge thank you to all of you who've been listening so far and for all your lovely feedback. If you've been enjoying the series, if you'd like to hear more, please give The Pisky Trap a like and a follow on Twitter and Instagram, and please share with your friends. If you'd like to help me keep this project going and enable me to keep offering you more episodes, you can check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the pisky trap and i'll pop the link in the show notes as well if you have any ideas for stories you'd like to hear more about whether it's traditional folk tales or little nuggets of local history from your area of devon or cornwall then feel free to get in touch you can drop me an email at the pisky trap at gmail.com the pisky trap is written and presented by me keith wallace with music by elizabeth westcott an original artwork by Karis Harrington. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Thanks for listening.